this week. Are Grand Lodges too obsessed with growing numbers of their individual lodges? Darren Laners takes another look at Dwight L. Smith's work and gives his contemporary response to his question. Can Freemasonry become so big that it becomes impersonal, which is antithetical to the entire craft? Then we'll turn toward the philosophic realm of a concept called toleration, the practice of tolerating something, in particular differences of opinion or behavior. What does tolerance really mean, philosophically? And how do we approach this in Freemasonry? Finally, we'll wrap it up with a single card tarot draw. Are we shying away from potential successful opportunities? All this and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back. This is episode number 534. In the news, not a whole lot going on. I guess the Conference of Grand Masters was last week up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I hope they had a great session. I had plans to go up there and sit in where I could. However, uh, I was unable to do so. I was pretty busy with work and the like. Most of us are these days. I want to thank the producers, fellows, contributors, and legacy partners of the show. If you are curious how you can assist us in bringing this podcast to the world, Masonic education to anybody who is interested in it, then head on over to wcypodcast.com, click on support the show, and see how you can help. Alternatively, we do have our shop where you can buy different items that I fulfill those right here from my workshop or my desk area, and I send those from me to you. And then, of course, we also have some affiliate links in the bookstore that will, some pennies from your orders come back to us. May 9th, I'll be doing the Masonic Pub Crawl, Freemasonry in America and its Colonial Tavern Beginnings for Lakeside Lodge, number 258 in Washington. A few days later, I'll be doing the Ark and Freemasonry as a virtual presentation also. Uh, That'll be for St. Charles, Missouri, chapter number one. And then just a month later, it's Esotericon, you guys. It's going to be rad. Now, Esotericon is not exclusively Masonic. However, many of the people involved are Freemasons. Here's the thing. You're thinking, oh no, another conference that I'm going to have to travel to. Well, no, we can't. You can't come. You just can't come. Sorry. (laughs) The reason why, actually, is that the in-person tickets are sold out. They are at capacity. So what is available is online access only which is $21.25, or you can get the online and a swag bag, which is $67.75. Again, it's a great conference. Who are the speakers? So you've got P.D. Newman, Jamie Paul Lamb, Chuck Dunning, Adam Goldman. I will be speaking as well. There will also be a really cool presentation about the Esoteric 101. It will feature the architects of Esotericon. So that is uh, Joe Martinez, Jason Richards, John Ruark, and Kevin Homan, who will be talking about this as well as their keynote presenter, Richard Smalley. That's right. Pretty cool. So uh, if you're unfamiliar with Richard Smalley, you can check out his stuff at innerchristianity.com. But again, Esotericon is not exclusively Masonic. So There are uh, tons of Masons who show up, mostly Masons, but there are people who come that are not Master Masons. They may be from other disciplines or other esoteric schools, men and women. But it is a wonderful conference that I highly encourage. I think mainly for a couple reasons. Uh, uh, Number one, I am a fan of systems that allow people to dive deeper into who they are in non-dogmatic ways. And number two, I like it because of its equity, uh, that it is inclusive of many other disciplines. So in short, check out Esotericon. 
Let's get into this week's first piece. We're going to continue our dissection that we've been reading of Whither Are We Traveling? Part 5. Now these pieces, uh, sometimes people are thinking, oh man, we're really dragging this out, but we're not. Brother Darren Laners is addressing each question with quotes and his own commentary on this. And what's important about this is that the questions that Dwight L. Smith wrote about in 1963 were relevant then as well as the previous years, and they are still relevant today. Why are they relevant? Well, because Freemasonry doesn't change too much. We have rules against it. With that said, it's probably been a while, at least since the publication of the Knights of the North, A Laudable Pursuit, which was a response to Dwight L. Smith's work. So it's, it's been a little while since somebody's had something to say about it. And I think Worshipful Brother Darren Laners has great words and commentary on this particular writing from Dwight L. Smith. So let's get into it. Whither Are We Traveling? Part 5. As we continue to explore Dwight L. Smith's seminal work, Whither Are We Traveling? We begin to explore his answers to the 10 questions he posed for self-examination of the state of ancient craft Freemasonry in 1963. The questions he asked are as important and relevant now as they were then. This week we look at question 4. Are we not worshipping at the altar of bigness? Now before I start reading this, when I first read this question, I thought, what the heck is the altar of bigness? And before we jump in, so you have an idea of what we're going to talk about, is that the altar of bigness is essentially the Grand Lodge's obsession with growing Freemasonry. Here we go. Most Worshipful Brother Smith starts his section with the following, quote, One of the most serious trends in American Freemasonry is the development of the oversized, impersonal lodge. Even though such a condition is utterly foreign to all traditions of Freemasonry, little or nothing is being done to correct it. On the contrary, lodges are encouraged and expected to become even larger. What the result will be, no one knows. It may require a crisis of the first order to bring us to our senses. The entire philosophy of Freemasonry is built around the individual, the erection of a moral edifice within the heart of man. All its symbolism is individual symbolism. All its tradition and practice is aimed at making individuals wiser, better, and consequently, happier. Mass movements simply have no place in Freemasonry and never have had. Then why do we worship at the altar of bigness? For one thing, we are Americans. We measure civilization in terms of automobiles, TV sets, and bathtubs. We count the number of gadgets as shown in the census reports and assume that means we are more civilized." End quote. The above lines remind me of some of the quotes from both the novel Fight Club and the movie of the same name. There are two in particular which I think echo most Worshipful Brother Smith's sentiment. The first is, quote, you buy furniture, you tell yourself this is the last sofa I will ever need in my life. Buy the sofa, then for a couple of years you're satisfied that no matter what goes wrong, at least you've got your sofa issue handled. Then the right set of dishes, then the perfect bed, the drapes, the rug, then you're trapped in your lovely nest, and the things you use to own, now they own you." End quote. The second quote is, Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy stuff we don't need. End quote. I believe that Worshipful Brother Smith sees that American consumerism is one of the ills of society which has infiltrated Freemasonry in the American quest for bigger being better. He saw that the membership numbers would be unsustainable, and that eventually, in adding members, many of which probably shouldn't have become members in the first place had the West Gate been guarded properly, would cause many lodges to lose the fellowship and camaraderie that would help keep them active. Most Worshipful Brother Smith goes on to state, in the United States, the average membership of Masonic Lodges is about 252. In Canada's nine jurisdictions, 166. In the seven, Australasia, 117. In Puerto Rico, 92. 
Scotland 85, England 80, Mexico 70, Germany 53. Interestingly enough, the small lodges overseas have little or no attendance problems. The brethren receive summonses to attend their lodge and they attend because it is worth attending and because the membership is small enough that there is a congenial, closely knit unit, a community of interest, if you please. And certainly no one can accuse the overseas lodges of not doing things in their benevolent work and their impact on community life. They put us to shame. In the 49 jurisdictions of the United States, average membership ranges from high of 482 to the District of Columbia to a low of 115 in North Dakota. There is even a lodge in Kansas with some 5,700 members. I almost hesitate to mention the fact that for fear some of our itchy Hoosier brethren will set out to exceed that record of doubtful distinction. Only nine jurisdictions have higher average memberships per lodge than Indiana's 336. They are all in densely populated states. It will give us grave concern, I am sure, to know we are 10th instead of at the top. Is all this talk some curious notion the Grand Secretary has all by himself? Not at all. Some of the best minds in American Freemasonry are deeply concerned. Speaking of poor lodge attendance, past Grand Master Ralph J. Pollard of Maine observes, quote, This problem is probably inherent in our American system of large lodges and relatively low dues. It is one of the prices we pay for bigness and cheapness. Probably the best long-range cure will be found in more and smaller lodges where more brethren can be put to work and where warmer and more intimate fraternal spirit can develop." End quote. Most Worshipful Smith continues, And in a masterly address before the Conference of Grand Secretaries in North America, in February of 1962, Dr. Thomas S. Roy, past Grand Master of Massachusetts, observed, quote, if we permit our lodges to increase membership to a size inconsistent with a close fellowship, then we have created the conditions for non-attendance. The Grand Lodge of England is chartering new lodges in England at the rate of over 25 a year. It is some significance that, according to the latest figures, the average membership in all lodges under the Grand Lodge of England is roughly 80." End quote. I will just say this. Our collective obsession with numbers has to stop. I'm guilty of it. Dwight Smith is guilty of it. Many of the authors of this blog are guilty of it. Most importantly, Grand Lodges are guilty of it. Do I think that some lodges have grown too large? Sure, I'm sure that's the case. However, regardless of the size of your lodge, I believe that you will only ever get a maximum of 20% of your total membership to show up at a stated meeting. If you have 60 members of your lodge and 12 show up to a stated meeting, then you are right at 20%. In many cases, you are going to be less, unless you have a traditional observance lodge or affiliation lodge, where your membership is capped at a certain number. Then you might need to have a higher number of active members. Otherwise, I think we need to stop obsessing over numbers. One of the things that I often hear get brought up in comparison to the future of Freemasonry is the Oddfellows. As an Oddfellow myself, I feel that comparison is a slap in the face to the Oddfellows. The Oddfellow Lodge that I belong to is in Tuscola, Illinois. They are an active and thriving community of artists, for the most part, and I believe that they are probably more active in their community than the Masonic Lodge there. To be honest, the Oddfellows as a whole are better positioned to survive and to recruit membership going into the future because they are more socially progressive by allowing women and are, in my personal experience, more LGBTQ plus friendly. While I'm not going to go into a diatribe about either, I will only say that if Grand Lodges are concerned with bringing in new members, they might want to actually enforce their so-called social media policies. The reactions of the majority of Masonic membership on the more popular Masonic Facebook groups toward either subject does not reflect Freemasonry in a good light. If they are truly concerned about bringing in new membership, then they need to do more to police the members that have joined while the West Gate was left mostly unguarded. Most Worshipful Brother Smith then asks what happens when we worship at the altar of bigness. One. Well, in the first place, our annual waste of leadership is nothing short of a sin. 
Every year, our lodges welcome into Masonic membership hundreds of men with great potential for inspired, dedicated leadership, and then we make certain they will have no opportunity to exercise it. Only one master can serve in a given lodge per year. We close the door on the best we have because we are too short-sighted, too solicitous of numbers and bank account to divide our membership into smaller units and utilize the manpower that is going to waste. Two, we provide too few opportunities for new members to use their talents and then wonder why they lose interest and drift away. I have heard lodge officers complain bitterly about new members coming once, twice, three times, and then no more. But why should they come when there is nothing for them to do except listen to the minutes and allow the bills? There is no place for them. Worst of all, no one seems to care. 3. The Fellowship of Freemasonry does not thrive in the mass. When will we ever learn that fellowship, that sweet and precious jewel of our brotherhood, is an intimate thing not shared with great numbers? Some of the most priceless memories of my 28 years as a Master Mason center around individual contacts with just a few of my brethren in the lodge room and about the table. Those times when we were doing things together, rejoicing in prosperity, standing steady in adversity, but always together. Thank God there weren't a thousand of us. If there had been, I dare say my interest in Freemasonry would have withered on the vine years ago. What must be the feeling of a newly raised member when he discovers that his lodge, which promised him fellowship and intimate friendships, is but a huge impersonal aggregation of strangers, a closed corporation, and we wonder why the membership curve goes downward, and why Masons do not attend meetings of their lodges? End quote. My personal opinion is that most worshipful brother Smith is suffering from cognitive bias in his first statement. I don't personally believe that every man that joins Freemasonry wants to be the master of his lodge. I believe that many members have no desire to go through the officer line. So while I believe that most worshipful Brother Smith is correct in stating that a larger lodge would impair one's ability to serve in the officer's line, I also believe that in many cases there is still a smaller pool of active members that would be potential officers. He is absolutely correct with his second statement. We need to do a better job of finding each member's talents and using them for the benefit of the Lodge, which is what Worshipful Brother Bill Hosler argues in his article, A Call to Service. It is absolutely imperative to give each member a purpose and make them feel a sense of belonging, which leads to his third point. On his third point, I would agree that Lodge must be welcoming and open to its new members. Every lodge needs to have as a priority a mentoring program that connects the new members with more experienced members of the lodge and needs to prioritize the membership experience. More on this in later articles. His impersonal lodges that are cliques are not going to be welcoming to new members regardless of their size. I do not see a correlation between a lodge's size and its accommodating new members. This being said, I do believe that we would be better off with 10 lodges of 25 members instead of one lodge with 250 members, if such a lodge still exists. Most Worshipful Brother Smith finishes this section with the following. 1. Just making certain that new lodges will be formed, that's all. Then why aren't we at work on a long-range, patient effort to correct a serious condition? Well, first of all, remember we are Americans and in all areas of life we worship at the altar of bigness. Two men came to my office to talk over what had to be done to form a lodge in a rapidly growing community. Let us call the community Suburbia. One of the brethren made a significant statement that has been ringing in my ears from that day to this. In my lodge of more than 1,500 members, he said, I haven't a ghost of a chance to ever go through the chairs. A new lodge, at least, would give me the chance. That lodge was never organized because a neighboring lodge sent a committee to serve notice to the brethren that we regard suburbia as a stockpile for our lodge. What happens to an institution designed to be simple becomes complex when units meant to be small become oversized and unwieldy when work intended for many is restricted to a handful when something that should be intimate becomes impersonal. What happens? Look around. Exhibit A is all about us. End quote. There is a lesson to be learned in Most Worshipful Brother Smith's first point. 
I take this from my own Mother Lodge's history. But Mother Lodge was formed by members of Ogden Lodge. These men petitioned several times to form a lodge in St. Joseph, Illinois, but they were blocked by one of the other members of Ogden Lodge. It is my understanding that it took the intervention of the Grand Master at the time to allow St. Joseph Lodge 970 to be born. Why? Because Ogden used St. Joseph as a recruiting resource and did not want to lose the membership they had already from St. Joseph. All this being said, I believe that now we see the opposite problem with a few exceptions. I believe that in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to see an unprecedented closing and consolidation of lodges. While I bemoan this, I also see potential benefits. Case in point, I'm a member of both Homer 199 and St. Joseph 970. I'm a plural at Homer. I was, up until a few years ago, also a plural member at Ogden Lodge. All of these lodges are located roughly less than 10 miles from each other, in a rural area where we are having to plural just to keep the lodges alive. Don't we need to ask the question if we'd be better off just consolidating the lodges? Wouldn't one lodge made up of the active membership of the three lodges be stronger than three separate lodges that are struggling to make a quorum every meeting? I think it's something to consider sooner rather than later. Secondly, I think Brother Smith was correct and continues to be correct in his second point. However, I think the motivations of many of these organizations are now mercenary. I believe that many new lodges are unable to use current Masonic buildings due to the ruling bodies of those buildings setting rents so high as to discourage the use of the building in an attempt to use the new lodge as a solution to keep the building open. Let's face facts. Many of our older buildings require a tremendous amount of money and effort to maintain. Also, many of our average lodge buildings were not built as multi-purpose or with retail space to allow the income from said space to be used to help maintain and upkeep the building that they reside in. I am lucky in that both the lodges that I belong to have such space, so that eliminates at least the need for us to do massive fundraisers to keep doors open. Many lodges do not have this luxury, so it leads itself toward the exploitation of other Masonic bodies using their space. This, in turn, leads to two results. One, the other Masonic body using the space can no longer financially support its agreement, so it is either forced to close, consolidate, or leave that space. And two, no other Masonic body is willing to occupy that space as they see what happened to X body and do not want a repeat of the events. For being so-called brothers, I have found in my personal experience that men can be prideful. Instead of wanting to look for solutions that include the other Masonic bodies that occupy the space, they often give them no say in the governing bodies that control the decision making for the building they occupy. So what happens in a situation where the governing body decides to raise rent on the other Masonic body without getting their input or working towards a mutually beneficial solution? So what instead happens is that the governing body raises rent and makes the space unaffordable to the lodge that is currently occupying it and forces that renting body into making a decision that I highlighted above. Instead of a win-win solution, lose-lose scenario occurs. I have seen this happen more than once in my own personal experience. In my next article, I'll explore the next question Brother Smith poses, which is number five. What can we expect when we have permitted Freemasonry to become subdivided into a score of organizations? Love this piece. Uh, you know, I think the only part of it that I disagree with, maybe slightly with Brother Darren Laners, is this idea of bigness and new candidates. I think there's an inherent problem with being so big that when a new guy comes in, he doesn't know where to go or who to talk to. But that really only applies to lodges that are so big that really have the attendance. Uh, if, as Brother Darren has stated, only 20% show up, then, yeah, that brother is probably receiving an okay welcoming into the fraternity. So my question is this, for our Craftsman Plus. I think most of us agree about quality over quantity and the Westgate. Is there a way we can promote this idea and reconcile what is sure to happen if we adhere to this 
as you know, smaller numbers begin to happen, how do we reconcile that with what the Grand Lodge is looking for? Can we find a medium point? Can we have Grand Lodges start to support the idea of smaller lodges, even if it means a massive dump off of membership numbers? Love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Next up, I want to talk about toleration. I think it is appropriate to define tolerance and some of the philosophical ideas that encompass tolerance and society and these kinds of things. As Freemasons, we are one of the most tolerant groups in the history of the modern world, arguably more so in the last hundred years or so than before. So when you type in something in Google like the problem with toleration, you'll get a quote from the paradox of tolerance. And this is this. The paradox of tolerance states that if a society is tolerant without limit, its ability to be tolerant is eventually seized or destroyed by the intolerant. And I believe this comes from the open society and its enemies. If we go to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, I'd like to read a couple of excerpts from their entry. 1. Toleration. The term toleration, from the Latin tolere, to put up with, countenance, or suffer, generally refers to the conditional acceptance of a non-interference with beliefs, actions, or practices that one considers to be wrong but still, quote-unquote, tolerable, such that they should not be prohibited or constrained. There are many contexts in which we speak of a person or an institution as being tolerant. Parents tolerate certain behaviors of their children. A friend tolerates the weakness of another. A monarch tolerates dissent. A church tolerates homosexuality. A state tolerates a minority religion. A society tolerates deviant behavior. Thus, for any analysis of the motives and reasons for toleration, the relevant contexts need to be taken into account. And here they give the concepts. I'd like to read the first point, the concept of toleration and its paradoxes. It is necessary to differentiate between a general concept and more specific conceptions of toleration. The former is marked by the following characteristics. First, it is essential for the concept of toleration that the tolerated beliefs or practices are considered to be objectionable and, in an important sense, wrong or bad. If this objection component is missing, we do not speak of toleration but of indifference or affirmation. Second, the objection component needs to be balanced by an acceptance component, which does not remove the negative judgment but gives certain positive reasons that trump the negative ones in the relevant context. In light of these reasons, it would be wrong not to tolerate what is wrong. To mention a well-known paradox of toleration, the said practices or beliefs are wrong but not intolerably wrong. Third, the limits of toleration need to be specified. They lie at the point where there are reasons for rejection that are stronger than the reasons for acceptance, which still leaves the open question of the appropriate means of possible intervention. Call this the rejection component. All three of those reasons can be of one and the same kind, religious, for example, yet they can also be of a diverse kinds, moral, religious, pragmatic, to mention a few possibilities. Furthermore, it needs to be stressed that there are two boundaries involved in this interpretation of the concept of toleration. The first one lies between the normative realm of those practices and beliefs one agrees with and, two, the realm of the practices and beliefs that one finds wrong but can still tolerate. The second boundary lies between this latter realm and, three, the realm of the intolerable that is strictly rejected. There are thus three, not just two, normative realms in a context of toleration. 
Finally, one can only speak of toleration where it is practiced voluntarily and is not compelled, for otherwise it would be a case of simply suffering or enduring certain things that one rejects but against which one is powerless. It is, however, wrong to conclude from this that the tolerant need to be in a position to effectively prohibit or interfere with the tolerated practices. For a minority that does not have this power may very well be tolerant in holding the view that if it had such power, it would not use it to suppress other parties. Based on these characteristics, we can identify three paradoxes of toleration that are much discussed in philosophical analysis of the concept. And each one refers to one of the components mentioned above. First, there is the paradox of the tolerant racist, which concerns the objection component. Sometimes people argue that someone who believes that there are quote-unquote inferior races, the members of which do not deserve equal respect, should be quote-unquote more tolerant. Thus, the racist would be called tolerant if he curbed his desire to discriminate against the members of such groups, say, for strategic reasons. Thus, if and only if we are considered tolerance to be a moral virtue, the paradox arises that an immoral attitude to think of other races in such a way would be turned into part of a virtue. What is more, the racist would be more quote-unquote tolerant the stronger his racist impulses are if only he did not act on them. Hence, Seen from a moral perspective, the demand that the racist should be tolerant has a major flaw. It takes the racist objection against others as an ethical objection that only needs to be restrained by adding certain reasons for acceptance. It thus turns an unacceptable prejudice into an ethical judgment. From this, it follows that the reasons for objection must be reasonable in a minimal sense. They cannot be generally shareable. Of course, but they must also not rest on irrational prejudice and hatred. The racist, therefore, can neither exemplify the virtue of tolerance, nor should he be asked to be tolerant. What is necessary is that he overcome his racist beliefs. This shows that there are cases in which tolerance is not the solution to intolerance. I will repeat that line. This shows that there are cases in which tolerance is not the solution to intolerance. Second, we encounter the paradox of moral tolerance, which arises in connection with the acceptance component. For various analysis of this paradox, one can see Ebbinghaus in 1950, Raphael in 1988, Mendes 1989, Horton 1994. If both the reasons for objection and the reasons for acceptance are called quote-unquote moral, the paradox arises that it seems to be morally right or even morally required to tolerate what is morally wrong. The solution of this paradox therefore requires a distinction between various kinds of quote-unquote moral reasons, some of which must be reasons of a higher order that ground and limit toleration. Third, there is the paradox of drawing the limits which concerns the rejection component. This paradox is inherent in the idea that toleration is a matter of reciprocity and that therefore those who are intolerant need not and cannot be tolerated. An idea we find in most of the classical texts on toleration. But even a brief look at these texts, and even more so at the historical practice, shows that the slogan quote-unquote no toleration of the intolerant is not just vacuous but potentially dangerous for the characterization of certain groups as intolerant is all too often itself a result of one-sidedness and intolerance in a deconstructivist reading this leads to a fatal conclusion for the concept of toleration if toleration always implies a drawing of the limits against the intolerant and intolerable and, if every such drawing of a limit is itself a more or less intolerant arbitrary act, toleration ends as soon as it begins. As soon as it is defined by an arbitrary boundary between us and the intolerant and intolerable, 
This paradox can only be overcome if we distinguish between two notions of intolerance that the deconstructivist critique conflates. The intolerance of those who lie beyond the limits of toleration because they deny toleration as a norm in the first place, and the lack of tolerance of those who do not want to tolerate a denial of the norm. Tolerance can only be a virtue if this distinction can be made, and it presupposes that the limits of toleration can be drawn in a non-arbitrary, justifiable way. The discussion so far implies that toleration is a normatively dependent concept. This means that by itself, it cannot provide the substantive reason for objection, acceptance, and rejection. It needs further independent normative resources in order to have certain substance, context, and limits, and in order to be regarded as something good at all. In itself, therefore, toleration is not a virtue or value. It can only be a value if backed by the right normative reasons. Part 2. Four Conceptions of Toleration The following discussion of four conceptions of toleration is not to be understood as the reconstruction of a linear historical succession. Rather, these are different, historically developed understandings of what toleration consists in that they can all be present in society at the same time, so that conflicts about the meaning of toleration may be understood as conflicts between these conceptions. 1. The first one I call the permission conception. According to it, toleration is a relation between an authority, or a majority, and a dissenting, different minority or various minorities. Toleration then means that the authority gives qualified permission to the minority to live according to their beliefs on a condition that the minority accepts the dominant position of the authority or majority. So long as their being different remains within certain limits, that is, in the private realm, and so long as the minority groups do not claim equal public or political status, they can be tolerated on pragmatic or principled grounds. On pragmatic grounds, because this form of toleration is the least costly of all possible alternatives and does not disturb civil peace and order as the dominant party defines it, but rather contributes to it. And on principle grounds, because one may think it is morally problematic to force people to give up certain deep-seated beliefs or practices. The permission conception is a classic one that we find in many historical writings and in instances of a politics of toleration, such as the Edict of Nantes in 1598, and that, to a considerable extent, still informs our understanding of the term. According to this conception, toleration means that the authority, or the majority, which has the power to interfere with the practice of a minority, nevertheless tolerates it, in quotes, while the minority accepts this inferior position. The situation or the terms of toleration are hierarchical. One party allows another party certain things on conditions specified by the first one. Toleration is thus understood as a permissio negativa mali, not interfering with something that is actually wrong but not intolerably harmful. It is this conception that Goeth had in mind when he said, quote, tolerance should be a temporary attitude only. It must lead to recognition. To tolerate means to insult." End quote. 2. The second conception, the coexistence conception, is similar to the first one in regarding toleration as the best means toward ending or avoiding conflict and toward pursuing one's own goals. What is different, however, is the relationship between the subjects and the objects of toleration. For now, the situation is not one of an authority or a majority in relation to a minority, but one of groups that are roughly equal in power, and who see that for the sake of social peace and the pursuit of their own interests, mutual toleration is the best of all possible alternatives. They prefer peaceful coexistence to conflict, and agree to a reciprocal compromise to certain modus vivendi, 
The relation of tolerance is no longer vertical, but horizontal. The subjects are at the same time the objects of toleration. This may not lead to a stable social situation in which trust can develop, for once the constellation of power changes, the more powerful group may no longer see any reason for being tolerant. 3. Different from this, the third conception of toleration, the respect conception, is one in which the tolerating parties respect one another in a more reciprocal sense. Even though they differ fundamentally in their ethical beliefs about good and true way of life and in their cultural practices, citizens recognize one another as moral, political equals, in the sense that their common framework of social life should, as far as fundamental questions of rights and liberties and the distribution of resources are concerned, be guided by norms that all parties can equally accept and that do not favor one specific ethical or cultural community. There are two models of the respect conception, that of formal equality and that of qualitative equality. The former operates on a strict distinction between the political and the private realm, according to which ethical differences among citizens of legal state should be confined to the private realm so that they do not lead to conflicts in the political sphere. This version is clearly exhibited in the secular republicanism of the French authorities, who held that headscarves with a religious meaning have no place in public schools, in which children are educated, to be autonomous citizens. The model of qualitative equality, on the other hand, recognizes that certain forms of formal equality favor those ethical cultural life forms whose beliefs and practices make it easier to accommodate a conventional public-private distinction. In other words, the formal equality model tends to be intolerant toward ethical cultural forms of life that require public presence that is different from traditional and hitherto dominant cultural forms. Thus, on the qualitative equality model, persons respect each other as political equals with a certain distinct ethical cultural identity that needs to be respected and tolerated as something that is a especially important for a person and b can provide good reasons for certain exceptions from or general changes in existing legal and social structures. Social and political equality and integration are thus seen to be compatible with cultural difference within certain moral limits of reciprocity. 4. In discussions of toleration, one finds alongside the conceptions mentioned thus far a fourth one, which I call esteem conception. This implies an even fuller, more demanding notion of mutual recognition between citizens than the respect conception does. Here, being tolerant does not just mean respecting members of other cultural life forms or religions as moral and political equals. It also means having some kind of ethical esteem for their beliefs, that is, taking them to be ethically valuable conceptions that even though different from one's own, are in some way ethically attractive and held with good reasons. For this still to be a case of toleration, the kind of esteem characteristic of these relations is something like reserved esteem, that is a kind of positive acceptance of a belief that for some reason you still find is not as attractive as the one you hold. As valuable as parts of the tolerated belief may be, it also has other parts that you find misguided or wrong. To answer the question which of these conceptions should be the guiding one for a given society, two aspects are important. The first one requires an assessment of the conflicts that require and allow for toleration, given the history and character of the groups involved, and the second requires an adequate and convincing normative justification of toleration in a given social context. It is important to keep in mind that the normative-dependent conception of toleration itself does not provide such a justification. This has to come from other normative resources. And the list of such resources, speaking both historically and systematically, is long. Now, so far we've given you a little bit to chew on. Maybe a lot bit to chew on. Which do you find yourself falling into? I want to jump ahead to their entry number four, and it's called Justifying. Toleration. Many of the systematic arguments for toleration may be, be they religious, pragmatic, moral, 
Epistemological can be used as a justification for more than one of the conceptions of toleration mentioned above. The classic argument for freedom of conscience, for example, has been used to justify arrangements according to the permission conception as well as the respect conception. Generally speaking, relations of toleration are hierarchically ordered according to the first conception, quite unstable according to the conception of coexistence, while the esteem conception is the most demanding in terms of the kind of mutual appreciation between the tolerating parties. In each case, the limits of toleration seem either arbitrary or too narrow, as in the esteem conception, which only allows toleration of those beliefs and practices that can be ethically valued. Accordingly, in current philosophical discussions of toleration in multicultural, modern societies, the quote-unquote respect conception is often seen as the most appropriate and promising. Yet in these discussions, toleration as quote-unquote respect can be justified in different ways. An ethical liberal neo-Lockean justification argues that respect is owed to individuals as personally and ethically autonomous beings with the capacity to choose, possibly revise and realize an individual conception of the good. The capacity is to be respected and furthered because it is seen as a necessary, though not sufficient, condition for attaining the good life. Hence the argument presupposes a specific thesis about the good life, in that only an autonomously chosen way of life can be a good life, which can, however, reasonably be questioned. One may doubt whether such a way of life will necessarily be subjectively more fulfilling or objectively more valuable than one adopted in a more traditional way without the presence of a range of operations to choose from. Apart from that, the ethical liberal theory could lead to a perfectionist justification of policies designed to further individual autonomy that could have paternalistic character and lack toleration for non-liberal ways of life. In other words, there is a danger of an insufficient distinction between the components of objection and rejection mentioned above in section 1. Thus, an alternative Neo-Balian justification of the respect conception seeks to avoid a particular conception of the good life, relying instead on the discursive principle of justification which says that every norm that is to be binding for a, a plurality of persons, especially norms that are the basis of legal coercion, must be justifiable with reasons that are reciprocally acceptable to all affected as free and equal persons. Such persons have the basic right to justification, which gives them the power to reject one-sided ethical or religious justifications for general norms. For a complete argument for toleration, however, this normative component has to be accompanied by an epistemological component which says that the ethical or religious reasons, if reciprocally contested, cannot be sufficient to justify the excise of force, since their validation depends on a particular faith that can reasonably be rejected by others who do not share it. Its validity reaches into a realm beyond reason, as Bale said, and also similar arguments by Rawls in 1993. Thus, toleration consists of the insight that reasons of ethical objection, even if deeply held, cannot be valid as general reasons of rejection so long as they are reciprocally rejectable as belonging to a conception of the good or true way of life that is not and need not be shareable. While such a distinction between ethical reasons for objection and stronger, morally justifiable reasons for rejection tries to overcome the paradox of moral tolerance. The paradox of drawing the limits would be solved by seeing as tolerable all such views or practices that do not violate the principle of justification itself. With such a reflexive turn in the debate about toleration, a number of questions arise as to the alleged superior validity of the principle of justification and the plausibility of a neo balian epistemology distinguishing between faith and knowledge. Can there be an impartial justification that is not in the same way a party to the contest of ethical truths and worldviews? Might there be the possibility, using a phrase John Rawls did in 1993, coined in the context of his theory of justice of a tolerant theory of toleration, 
that is at the same time substantive, enough to ground, and also limit toleration. And to wrap this look philosophically at toleration before we get into the next piece, let's look at the politics of toleration very quickly. Any concrete use of the concept of toleration is always situated in particular contexts of normative and political conflict, especially in societies that are transforming toward increased religious, ethical, and cultural pluralism. Even more so when societies are marked by an increased awareness of such pluralism, with some cultural groups raising new claims for recognition and others looking at their co-citizens with suspicion, despite having lived together for some time in the past. These social conflicts always involve group-based claims for recognition both in the legal and in the social sphere. Contemporary debates has focused on questions of respecting particular religious practices and beliefs, ranging from certain manners of dress, including the burqa, to certain demands to be free from blasphemy and religious insults. The general questions raised here include what is special about religious as opposed to other cultural identities? When is equal respect called for, and what exactly does it imply with respect to, for example, norms of gender equity? Equality. What role do past injustices play in weighing claims for recognition, and how much room can there be for autonomous forms of life in a deeply pluralistic society? Other connected and intensely debated issues of toleration include free speech and hate speech, as well as the ways in which new forms of digital communication change the nature of social and political discourse. Finally, in light of Goethe's remark that to tolerate also means to insult, those working from the perspective of a critical theory of toleration discuss how power can be exercised not only by denying toleration, but also by disciplining when granting toleration. As much as politics of toleration aims to express mutual respect, it also involves disagreement, mutual criticism, and rejection. We still face the challenge of examining the grounds and forms of politics of toleration as an emancipatory form of politics. Now, I'll have the full text available for you as a link in the show notes for you to go over and pull notes from. But now... We know what toleration is, we know about some of its paradoxes, and we know about some of the four conceptions of toleration, the types that we use. Now let's see what additional points the idea of tolerance has for the fraternity. What follows is an article that I co-authored with brother Kevin Homan. It's called Reverence for All Beliefs. An Exploration of Consequences and Revelation of Moral Geography. Now, if that title sounds wordy or lofty, it kind of is. The reverence for all beliefs is about our individual tolerance in the fraternity. But maybe we don't have tolerance in the fraternity. Maybe we have something else. Because I don't know anybody in my lodge who simply tolerates others' beliefs. We accept them. The second part of the title, An Exploration of Consequences and Revelation of Moral Geography, refers to the idea that there are consequences for us when people see where we are in our moral geography. Here we go. A joint op-ed by Midnight Freemason contributor R.H. Johnson and guest contributor Kevin Homan. It is a long-standing belief within Freemasonry, and the world for that matter, that each person, each individual conscious mind, has an inalienable right of personal liberty, personal choice, personal belief, and the freedom to explore those rights in the search for happiness. Thomas Paine writes in The Rights of Man, whatever is my right as a man is also the right of another, and it becomes my duty to guarantee as well as to possess. In this quote, we find the general position of the enlightened world to verdantly assert the individual's rights to all things, and within this, what is good for the goose is good for the gander. That is, if one has a complete freedom, all must have the same. What of these freedoms are tangible? A tangible freedom is an idea made real by its practice in the real world in which we live. We think and those thoughts beget action. When 
We act on these thoughts. We have unleashed a wave of probable outcomes, infinite in consequence. In just one example, we have freedom of speech, yet we are not immune from the consequences of the words we write or that we vocalize. The rights guaranteed to all humanity are so divine, so spiritual, and so personal, they are an ingrained part of our being. They determine how we act, who we are friends with, what groups we belong to, and can even determine our socioeconomic statuses. The topic in this paper is the freedom of belief and the respect the Masonic fraternity has for the individual rights of men to hold whatever beliefs they see fit so long as they check a number of ascribed boxes to which our fraternity is bound. Of those boxes within regular male craft Freemasonry regarding belief, we would see the acceptance of a supreme being. Some will argue monotheism. Outside of this singular qualification which speaks to personal belief, there are two other attributes outlined within the interrogatories and question and answer portions of our ritual. Whether or not the ritual is to be taken literally or not is a matter to be taken up by the Grand Master in each state, for only the Grand Master in each state can make such a judgment. These other qualifications stipulate that a candidate who has come before the Lodge for initiation is of good report and well recommended. In obvious terms, this means that the candidate is known by the proposers to be a good man, free from the allurements of vice and crime, a man who can be trusted. The other qualifications are to do with proper age, at least 18, and that the candidate is vouched for. These last two pieces, as they relate to being admitted into our fraternity, speak nothing of the general character of those whom we seek to initiate. We ask our candidates if they are members of any group to which membership within the Masonic fraternity is incompatible. In our 27 years of combined service to the craft, we have never stopped an initiation due to a response to this question. Of this question, we have much to discuss. It is a question that when contemplated opens a door that cannot be shut, for it forces us to look to the hearts and consciousnesses of our existing members and our petitioners. To what organizations do they belong that the various Masonic credos would be in opposition? Belonging to such an organization is a physical and real world, tangible enterprise born from a personal ideology. After a proper investigation of the petitioner or a reflective moment on a current member and their ideological alignments, we get an objective view of where they stand in the geography of the moral landscape. These ideologies live in the minds of humans and in many cases are secret. The secret beliefs of men held within the prisons of their own minds are often due to an intrinsic shame or perhaps a general fear that the beliefs they hold are such of a minority opinion they'll be looked at as uh, pariah. There's even a chance that by the extolling of one's personal ideologies, they will be accused of one of the more many deadly sins of the 21st century, forever labeled in a pejorative manner. They will forever be tormented or canceled. Men today belong to many organizations who may not have anything to hold against Freemasonry. However, should we be now concerned enough to ask whether or not a person is a member of an organization to which Freemasonry is incompatible. Organizations that hold values, beliefs, or practices that are antithetical to what our craft teaches? Contrarily, flipping the tables as it were, are there such organizations? Are there such ideological beliefs that are in fact incompatible with the membership of this gentle craft? Antifa? The Ku Klux Klan? The Proud Boys? QAnon? While we may answer unequivocally that one could not reconcile Freemasonry and any of the aforementioned groups, the fact remains that we have members within our organization today that do belong to these schemes. Not only this, they financially back these organizations while complaining about lodge dues. They share articles and disinformation on social media networks, attack ideologies that are contrary to theirs, and criticize all of the principles counter to their beliefs. The organizations mentioned above are just that organizations of peoples bound together by beliefs in particular ideals or shared goals. But what about religious beliefs? 
Are there religions that teach their truths that are also misaligned with what the craft teaches? And staying with that theme of this article, and using the same mindfulness we're talking about in respect to morality and compatibility, shouldn't it also apply to religions as well? It is an ideology, after all. It's often assumed and said that it's common to respect others' beliefs. Borrowing from another famous quote, respect is earned, not given, which is actually part of a larger quote from Pakistani beggar King Hussein Nissa, quote, treat people the way you want to be treated. Talk to people the way you want to be talked to. Respect is earned, not given, end quote. Respecting one's religious and political beliefs is certainly common happenstance so long as they fall within the cultural norms, which are always evolving. Or to extend that for this piece, the tenets of Freemasonry, the progressive moral science. This is nothing more than a distraction from the original argument. The answer is of course yes, everyone is entitled to their own particular beliefs. We are not, however, required to respect them. These two things are mutually exclusive. I can respect your right to your own opinion, while at the same time not having to respect it. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and as outlined above, while we have freedom of speech, that speech can have consequences. Say or support speech that is unbecoming of a mason, and you're likely to be reminded of your error. The question remains, if we don't respect the beliefs of a brother who is a racist or a bigot, are we the problem? Or should we tell it like it is and remove them from our ranks? Or do as we always have done, let sleeping dogs lie? Which brings us to the subject of consequence. The consequences of allowing behaviors of the groups mentioned above as acceptable or even compatible with Freemasonry will be seen by the public, by the prospective membership, as weak, unintellectual, antiquated, irrelevant, anti-progressive, maybe even disgusting. In other words, it will be the death of the institution. Let's remember that no matter how good someone's ritual is, no matter how many times they were there for the lodge, or how much they donated, it doesn't make them a good person. Is Freemasonry to be the home of good men attempting to become better? And can you be a racist or a bigot as a member who is trying to become better by being a Freemason? Or should we just bar all racists and bigots from entering from the beginning, solving the problem at its core, with small wins coming from the deaths of those bigots and racists who made it past the West Gate to begin with? As is often suggested by Masonic forefathers perhaps recentering ourselves, recommitting to what the craft demands of us in principle to quote-unquote try Freemasonry is all we need to do. Defining principles or mission statements of note. Freemasonry varies from state to state. To promote a way of life that binds like-minded men in a worldwide brotherhood that transcends all religious, ethnic, cultural, social, and educational differences by teaching the great principles of brotherly love, relief, and truth, and by the outward expression of these through its fellowship to find ways in which to serve God, family, country, neighbors, and self. Taken from Reading Lodge, number 254, California. The above description of Freemasonry certainly doesn't square with any of the descriptions below. As such, anyone identifying with such groups should not be allowed into our fraternity. The groups below that are defined were a selection of various groups to which members of the craft have taken to be of questionable reputation, if not downright disgusting. Antifa, the Ku Klux Klan, the Proud Boys, QAnon, all of which are defined, and their mission statements and defining principles are outlined and taken from ADL.org, which is the Anti-Defamation League. So. My brothers, that is the end of the section that I wanted to cover this week on toleration. It's not exactly what we thought. Toleration. It's not a good thing. It's a halfway point between conflict and full acceptance. May we strive to be more than tolerant for the people who stand for good things, for the, for the ideologies that stand for the respect of all peoples that do no harm to anyone else and raise everybody up to give everybody those things that we are always talking about at Freemasonry, the equality of men 
and to extend that to everyone. My question for the Craftsman Plus this week, obviously you never have to answer anything, but I am curious. As we look inward, you don't have to mention the particulars, but have you ever found yourself in Lodge? And by the definitions that we talked about today on the show, have you found yourself merely tolerant of a member rather than accepting of a brother? I, of course, will fill you in on my response there as well, and uh, I'll be as vulnerable as possible. Let's wrap it up this week with a quick single card tarot reflection. Now, as I made my way over to the shelf, the shelves, plural, that hold all of my tarot, oh, most of my tarot decks that I use on a regular basis, one in particular caught my eye. It's the Robin Wood Tarot, which was, of course, created by Robin Wood. It's a 78-card deck and comes in a pretty plain box. But anyway, now, the reason it caught my eye, it was green. And, you know, just having come back from Masonic Week a little while ago, all that AMD, just that yeah, flashy green was in my head. I guess that's why I grabbed it. I'm going to go ahead and give these cards a quick shuffle. Now, for those of us who are new to this segment, this is not a tarot reading per se. This is simply uh, drawing a singular card and then using its traditionally accepted meaning to ask a question about ourselves. And maybe the answer to that question is really easy, but maybe sometimes, and more often than not, does require a good bit of thought. I do like this deck, obviously, because I bought it and I use it. It's got a good weight card, as I mentioned last week about another deck that we used. You can actually shuffle these cards by splitting them right down the middle singularly, rather than having to like split it into four and shuffle them that way. Shuffle them just like regular old 52 deck uh, poker decks. Anyway, so I'm just going to go ahead and shuffle them up a little bit. And let's see what we get. I'm just going to take one card off the top. Uh, we have a Four of Cups. I will post a picture of the Four of Cups in the Craftsman Plus group so that you can see what we're looking at. It's kind of nice. We don't have to worry about inversions this week. Normally, I don't like them anyway, so great. Uh, why don't I like them? Just because there's often like negative things that kind of come out of a, a flipped card. However, the flipped card negatives are... I don't know, there's always kind of like a hidden good thing, right? So uh, the Four of Cups is a gentleman who is sitting under a tree. Uh, sometimes he's looking kind of frowny. There are three cups in front of him and one magically appearing to his right. Where did it come from? Well, let's see what this card could mean for us. As I mentioned, the character in the card sometimes looks frowny or he's generally got a posture that just doesn't seem very friendly. This is due to a couple things. He's either meditating or maybe he has some apathy or maybe he is just really thinking hard about something. Contemplation or as uh, Waite puts it, reevaluation. Typically the man in the card has his arms crossed. Uh, kind of like a harumph look, you know. Um, in this one, he just looks slightly angered and looking off in the, the distance. Uh, He's barefoot on the grass, of course, you know, touching the foundation. The three cups in front of the gentleman might represent current things you have on your plate. And the reason why you're evaluating or maybe you're negative about the cup that has just popped into existence is you're saying, mm, not yet. Uh, I might not want to take this on just yet. It also could mean because of the meditative quality of the card, that you're really working on yourself. You're doing more meditations. You're taking time out of every day, maybe five, 10 minutes to sit and quiet your mind. And of course, as I said, with the feet being bare and he's touching the firmament, this is that you know where you're standing. You're positioned to say yes or no to opportunities that present themselves. It also might mean, you know, like I've got these three cups. That's what I've got for right now. I don't know if I want this fourth one. Maybe not now, but later. 
As I mentioned also, he has this kind of look of unsatisfiedness. This could be that you're bored, you're dissatisfied with things that happen on a day-to-day path, that also it's saying if you're dissatisfied, you've got these three cups and he's kind of like, Don't forget about this awesome, great opportunity over here, this new fourth cup that appears. However, when I get this card, the thing that I always ask myself is, what opportunity am I not paying attention to? Or what opportunity have I shunned? Not because I don't want to. There's a reason I don't want to. It's, what have I shunned? What am I pushing off? Because I don't want to get hurt again, or I don't want to have the same problems I had before. But we have to remind each other that with new challenges comes growth. So maybe it's a time to say, hey, maybe I'm part of a a lodge that doesn't do a progressive line. You qualify to be the worshipful master, and yet a bunch of your friends and brothers at the lodge are like, man, you should throw your hat in the ring for to being the worshipful master. And you think, well, I don't want to do that. I ran before and I didn't get elected. Or maybe whatever whatever office it is for your lodge. But it's saying, hey, don't don't discount it, right? The worst thing that can ever happen is a no. Oh, okay, better luck next time. Or maybe you're thinking about putting in some new legislation for the Grand Lodge. And hey, you, you presented something a couple years ago, people really didn't like it, and and you think that's somehow gonna reflect on the new thing that you want to propose. Don't let the negativity stop you there, right? Don't worry about how you got hurt before, because every situation is new moving forward. So I hope that gives you some insight. I'll post a picture to this. My question for the Craftsman Plus for this one is, in the last 10 years, what have you shied away from doing that you wish you had done sooner and found success, right? Like a lot of people say, I wish I started my own business a lot sooner. I was just too scared or whatever it is. Give me an example of something like that. And if you don't have one, then Maybe read about some of the brothers who have taken those little leaps to great success. That's it for this week. I want to thank you all for joining us on this edifying episode. I hope you really learned something as well as uh, enjoyed yourself. I certainly learn every time I read these articles and uh, we're all in the quarries together. If you like this show and you want to help out and support it, head on over to WCYpodcast.com. Click on support the show and see how you can assist. I want to thank our producers, fellows, contributors, and of course our legacy partners. If you missed the Masonic Roundtable with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison as our guest on Generational Freemasonry, you gotta go back and listen to it. It was a fantastic episode. Epic, even. That's it. So, until next week, everybody, stay on the level. For whence came you, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.
Media.